Welcome to the Poison Pen. I'm Barbara Peters with a permanently scratchy voice. Apparently, we were just discussing, Patrick and I, who's working with me tonight, whether it's the allergy season, but <laughs> it's not going well. So I'm sorry if I sound kind of <clears throat> raspy. In any case, I'm delighted to be spending time here for a while with Mike Madden. Hi, Mike. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Well, you heard me say, other than the scratchy throat, though, I'm absolutely great. Where are you? You look like you're in a bunker back there in Sevierville, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm in a bunker in an elevated platform. Absolutely. Now, this is my office. This is this is where the magic happens, as it were. I love it. What's it made out of? Is it logs? Yes, it's actually D logs, and uh, it was an outside porch. And uh, when we bought the place, and we converted it to an office, so we've got an amazing picture window that's about eight feet wide. And I overlook a valley that I get to see Mount Leconte every morning. And it's, it's honestly quite distracting. Uh, I get four fantastic seasons of unbelievable weather and changes of, of foliage. Just it, it, It's just a writer's paradise, except for the fact that I'm paying more attention to the window than the writing. So sometimes I have to close the window. So, R.E.M. me slightly. I used to live in your part of the country, and I've spent a fair amount of time in Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, and, you know, up in the Smoky Mountain National Park. I've actually hiked my Lacan and spent the night on the mountain. Going, oh, good for you. That's awesome. Yeah, everyone's got to do uh, hike the mountain at least once. Yeah, and spend the night. Um, it's a lot easier coming down the next morning than it was going oh, yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But where, where are you in relation to all that? Are you in the park or where? Are you near Dolly Partonville or what? I'm, I'm technically in Sevierville, uh, so I'm about 15, 20 minutes from the park entrance. I take uh, the parkway, and uh, I've got a, a great view of the mountains. Uh, if for those of you who live in Sevierville, I live kind of on the Apple Barn. If you've ever been to Sevierville, you've been to the Apple Barn, and uh, one of the best breakfasts in the Smokies. And, uh, we live up behind there. I have a whole set of gorgeous earthenware mugs that were made in the Pigeon Forge pottery. They're edged with different animals, um, and, yeah. and I'm really fond of them. Anyway, it seems a sort of unlikely location for a person writing Tom Clancy, but what the hell? Um, I, but, but when isolation, we, is, isolation is key. Yes, social distancing, the key for authors. When we first met, you had written a book um, about drones. I remember that drones were an essential part of the plot, but it wasn't a Clancy. And you wrote, what, two or three of those books before you began to write the Jack Ryans? Yeah, I had four books in that series. And then uh, after the last book was over with, Tom Colgan, <clears throat> who is a drone series paperback editor. He's also the Tom Clancy series editor. And he's familiar with my work, and he was generous enough uh, and perhaps even foolish enough to make the offer to me to write a Tom Clancy series on the, especially the Jack Ryan focus. And so the first one of those was, well now four books ago, this is my fourth book in the, in the Jack Ryan series. It's been an inter, <clears throat> excuse me, I keep losing my voice. I think it's been an interesting thing that your publisher has been able to rotate a number of you in and out of the Clancy franchise. And it always seems to work out well. I mean, Mark Graney has gone on to write The Gray Man independently. Um, you came into it writing something, and then, you know, who knows? You'll write some of these, and then you'll move on. Uh, what do you learn in writing The Clancy as compared to writing your own books? Is there a learning curve? Does it benefit you? Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it benefits me. Um, some people might think that writing within a franchise would be restrictive or binding, but for me, it's like you know the two rails on a railroad. Uh, the engine can't run if the wheels are on on the track, and so the Clancy franchise gives me this amazing track. I've got these fantastic characters like President Ryan, like John Clark, or you know, of course, Jack Ryan Jr. So Tom Clancy created this amazing world uh, that I get to inhabit that's already built, uh, and these amazing characters that I get to explore and, and develop. So it's almost like having train wheels is probably the wrong analogy. It's probably like having racing wheels, you know, tacked onto your uh, little Ford uh, Fiesta and put an engine in front. And so I get to stomp the gas and go as fast as I want. And I think well, the, really the genius of what the Clancy Estate has done and, and Tom Colgan in particular was when they bring writers on, at least in my case, I'm, I'm sure the other writers would agree with this. The first thing they say is don't try to imitate Tom Clancy. And they're right, because you can't you know, imitate originality. 
So they really do say, write in your own voice, write out of your own perspective and with your own passion. So they give us absolute freedom to be ourselves creatively, so long as you know we stay you know on on the tracks. Um, the analogy I like to say is you know Tom Clancy built this amazing FAO Schwartz multi-story uh, toy store, uh, but they've opened the, the the bottom door and let me in to go play. I, the, the only admonition is don't break anything, but have fun. So that's what we get to do, and I think that's why it works so well. And Don Bentley is coming on. And he's taking on the Jack Junior franchise starting next year. He wrote Without Sanction, which is just absolutely one of my favorite thrillers in the last several years. Absolutely killed it. An original new voice in the genre. So I can't wait to see what he does with Jack Junior. So it was an interesting decision to hive it off so that one section is writing Jack Senior, and the other group, you and now Don, are writing Jack Junior. Um, did you get a choice, or were you just assigned Jack Jr.? I was assigned Jack Jr., and, and, and gratefully so. Uh, this, it's, uh, the mandate for the Jack Jr. books is technically, like I said, separate than the Jack Sr. books. So um, Mark Cameron, who does the Sr. books, and they come out in the fall, he has a longer or larger word count than I do, so uh, that's one challenge. And his, his mandate is to focus more on sort of the national and the geopolitical and sort of the really large stories. So the whole campus is involved, uh, more segments of the maybe American government are involved. And so it's a much more of a global plot, so a traditional Clancy. My mandate is to focus primarily on Jack Jr. So my stories almost invariably put him in remote places away from the campus and away from resources. So he has to rely more on his own. But because I love the series, I love the franchise, I love the characters, I do always bring in the president or some John Clark. So I, I still get to play with everybody, but on my own terms. And I don't have to do the, the enormous uh, weightlifting that Mark Cameron has to do to carry the entire franchise on his back. Yeah. He's, he's so good at what he does, and I'm so impressed with the way he handles that. He's a really wonderful guy, and although he's, he's doing all that, and yet he's still writing his own police procedural Alaska-based series, so he's obviously a hard worker, and I know he travels because he was going to come see us before the pandemic shut everything down, and right before that, he was traveling around in the wilds of Asia or somewhere doing research, you know, for a book, so he's got a very full plate. I, I, it's rumored he has not slept since 1978. I, that, that guy works and works and works. And he is, he and his wife are genuinely just delightful people. And he is retired uh, federal marshal who lives in Alaska. And whatever you think that means, uh, if you've never met him, that's what he is. Uh, so he's, he's awesome. I'm, I'm a big fan of Mark. I am too. He's really nice. He's been here for several books, and we we were sad to miss him this spring, but it all happened before we'd all gotten up to speed with virtual events and you know so we just kind of lost him but we'll come back to it um has the tv before we talk about this new book has the tv jack ryan jr in any way affected how you write or how you think about jack or is that just a completely different universe yeah it's a completely different universe um what I love most about the Prime series, I suppose, is because it's John Krasinski and it's a young guy, and it says Jack Ryan, uh, my fans think it's Jack Ryan Jr. So they think I'm awesome writing these off like these scripts, which of course I'm not. Um, it's really Jack Ryan Sr. reimagined as a young man in the current era. So uh, it's almost like when they rebooted the Star Trek series um, a few years ago. So it's a completely different universe, a different time, different situations so no longer battling the Soviet Union but battling you know Al Qaeda or what have you so um, no it doesn't really affect me what I do love about the TV series is that right for myself I've always I started writing screenplays uh, for my fiction work and so I approach novels more like a screenplay I, I, I literally see every scene in my mind before I start writing I really try to make it as visual as possible uh, as I proceed through the story. So uh, I've, I've taken on more of the novelistic bent. I have uh, more words in a novel than a screenplay, obviously. But uh, the visual impact, I think, is really important for readers because we're more of a visual culture now. We don't read as much and we watch more. So um, I do want my novels to be as visually uh, impactful as possible. 
I don't think there's any way that this new long-form television doesn't have some effect on readers and expectations. I thought the first one was pretty good. I thought the second one had so many plot holes in it, um, the Venezuela one. I love the I love the scenery and all, but I was not really that impressed with the structure of the story. But then, you know me, I'm tough on structure, so I wouldn't be. That's the, the three rules of writing, right? Structure, structure, structure. So it's, it's key. It really is. Um, it's hard. It's hard making television, and, and long-form television in particular. So those, those, the, the estate and the, the, the TV uh, producers have no connection um, to the book side of it. I mean, obviously, the, French, uh, the estate owns both, but um, we don't coordinate anything. We don't talk to them. They don't reach out to us. Um, I mean, I've reached out to them, but they're doing their own thing, and I, I respect that, and I get that, and I'm excited for them. And I, I was sad to hear they've canceled the third season because of the coronavirus, but presumably when things settle down, they'll, they'll get to the third season. Well, a lot of things have been canceled. Um, it's easier to do a virtual event with an author than it is to figure out how to film an entire... I think The Blacklist was a great example of that because they had to quit... Uh, in the middle of filming the last episode of the season or something, and they switched to cartoons. And I gather that that has had a, a very mixed reaction. Some people have loved it. I haven't watched it. My younger daughter hated it. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was creative in the sense that if they couldn't get the, the crew back on the set that to finish the last, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes of it with cartoons was a, you know, animation was a really interesting idea. I agree. It was very smart, and, and part of my challenge was I thought the animation was um, not as good as I would have preferred, but it solved the problem. So I agree with that. I think it's a really smart move to do. And I, I'm of the paranoid set of uh, advancing AI. I, I think in the relatively near future, they'll hire actors to come in. They'll basically load their images up into computers and then just sort of plug in images into scripts anyway and not even bother with actual acting. Um, I think manipulation of images is gonna be a huge uh, uh, development in the next 10 years because it's so much easier to manipulate, you know, uh, zeros and ones on a computer than it is to actually bring whole cast and crews together. Well, I'll tell you an example of that. Call of the Wild, the new, you know, reimagined dog movie with Harrison oh, Ford. It was, but here's the really unnerving part. We watched it and, you know, it was, um, not a real dog, but in fact, um, an, an AI dog. But then, um, trying to take a little break from watching a very dark crime series set in Finland, we stumbled upon the remake of Benji. And as we watched Benji, Rob and I kept saying to each other, is that a real dog or is that an AI dog? Because some of the stuff the dog was doing, you really had to wonder whether these were trained dogs or whether they had inserted like they did on Call of the Wild, you know, AI. So I can see that um, animals might actually be more, maybe more frequently substituted with AI than people. Well, sure, because they're much more difficult to work with. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could have a whole herd of elephants or whatever it is without all the extreme difficulty of managing a whole herd of elephants. Well, let's talk about your book. We sort of goofed around, and this is my commercial moment to say that these beautiful copies of Firing Point by Tom Clancy and Mike Madden have arrived to us from the very hand of Mike Madden. These are autographed books, and they are here for sale. So let me first of all thank you for doing that. Oh, glad to do it. Very happy to do it. I just... Uh... As you said, I, I first met you in 2013 when Drum came out, and one of my, the genuine pleasures of my career in my life is to come visit you and hang out with you guys, and you have an amazing bookstore. Um, and I don't think people realize uh, you're not just a local bookstore. You you reach out all over the planet. I forget what percentage of your business is actually international now, but a lot. You, you know, yeah, you sell a lot of books, and you're you're an important part of the the book selling and book writing communities. So thank you for what you do and. Yeah, I really do encourage people to, uh, to contact you and order books uh, online with you, or I guess they can call you up and uh, sign copies are available. They are, and that reminds me as I finish the commercial break here that in fact we do ship internationally every day. So if you happen to be a Tom Clancy fan and you are living outside the United States and you want an autographed book, we can do that. So um, I have spent a lot of time in Catalonia. I have spent a lot of time in Barcelona. So you can imagine how pleased I was to discover that um, a, 
part of this book takes advantage of the serious movements for separation between Catalonia and España. Um, and it was fun to visit them with it. What inspired you to look at that just because there's all this insurgent action and you could get into it? Uh, certainly. I mean, you know, my background is you know, politics and history. And so I'm always engaged with those subjects. And on October 1st of 2017, I mean, something really remarkable happened. The uh, Catalonian people voted and 92% of the people who voted uh, voted for independence. They want to be an independent state from Spain. And of course, being an American, uh, 1776 and self determination and uh, the revolution, all of that, uh, you know, sort of resonate with that. You know, people have the right to self determination. So they voted for it. They said we went out, and the Spanish government uh, said no, uh, in Spanish, by the way, uh, which is also no. And uh, in come the police and tear gas and billy clubs and violence and and suddenly hundreds of thousands of people are in the streets, if not actually a million at one point. Uh, so much so that even uh, the airport uh, in Barcelona was shut down a couple of days before we flew there, my wife and I. So we almost didn't know if we'd make it. But make a long story short, so Madrid, of course, dropped the hammer and said no. And the Ur European Union backed them up, which is surprising, and basically sort of the UN and everybody else. I mean, you know, sorry, self-determination and democracy and voting just don't count for you which is sort of a remarkable thing to be talking about in, you know, 21st century Western Europe. So that just really got me to thinking about, you know, what's going on there. And, and it was also part of the theme of an exploring over all over, over this course of the series uh, with uh, Line of Sight, which the book that preceded uh, 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 Enemy Contact, uh, that was about the Yugoslavian uh, situation and the, the civil war that happened in Yugoslavia when it broke up. So it's the same idea of what does it mean to be a human being? You know, when you answer the question, who am I? Part of the answer is your sense of nationality, of citizenship, of place, of patriotism, of loyalty, and fill in the blanks. And so uh, fast forwarding on that theme, the, the Catalonian situation you know, perfectly resonated with that. So, you know, for an American citizen like Jack Ryan Jr., red-blooded American patriotic citizen, to be in the middle of that, I thought would be really interesting. So that's why I picked that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, the Soviet Union broke up uh, and splintered back into numerous republics, which Mr. Putin is trying to reassemble. Czechoslovakia got free and then it split up into two parts. But I have been, I was in Canada at the height of the separation movement where the Quebecois wanted to, you know, split off from Canada. And ultimately that did not work. We've seen Scotland have at least one referendum, might very well come to another, about whether to break up um, the United Kingdom. And then we've seen that Spain hung on to Catalonia. So, you know, that it goes differently for different groups of people in different countries. It doesn't always work out to separate. No, I mean, there is this tension. I mean, there are obvious advantages to globalism. A world without borders, or for example, a year without borders, means that one passport, no passport checks. You, 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 you bring regulations into line so that you know you can sell things across the border without uh, penalty. You have one currency. Uh, you know, large corporations, global corporations, global uh, transnational organizations, many advantages, uh, but they also come at a cost. So. It's awesome to go to Walmart, where there's lots and lots of uh, goods from all over the world, mostly China, and they're very inexpensive, which is awesome, but at what cost? And the cost is the destruction of, say, local you know, mom and pop businesses, uh, depression of wages, and, and so on and so forth. So this tension back and forth between sort of globalism, for lack of a better term, versus nationalism, or you know, sort of the universal versus the local, is playing out over and over and over. And so. Brexit is an example of where, even where they voted to leave, it seems really difficult to leave. Or at least the elites don't want them to leave. Um, but uh, Italy is is reconsidering, once again, its place in the EU. Poland is, is rethinking its position in Europe. Hungary is. So this issue of separation, of, uh, of breaking down these large supranational organizations and retreating back to sort of national organization, uh, is a very important trend right now in, in international politics, and I think it's going to accelerate uh, rather than recede. 
I think you're absolutely right. I think the pandemic has laid bare a lot of hazards connected with global shipping. Um, just to get the cheaper, the cheaper price is proving to be disastrous at the moment when we have outsourced so much stuff to, you know, cheaper places. I think you're right. I think that there will be a resurgence of local and national. And we even see that in terms of shop local and so forth. And it's been interesting during the pandemic to see that while Amazon has benefited in a lot of ways, an awful lot of local businesses have also seen increased business as people realize how scary it is to be dependent on some supra thing that could collapse. You know, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that there's going to be a lot of restructuring. I would love to see more manufacturing come back to the United States. I'd be perfectly happy to pay more money, you know, in order to see that happen for products. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a huge mistake to think that you're staying in the aisle of large big big box store with your cheap, you know, manufactured item and think, "Oh, I'm saving all this money." Because in fact, you know, when your neighbor lo no longer has a job and now they're on employment, I mean, you're, you're paying a lot for that cheap manufactured good that's been imported, you know, and also built with not just cheap labor. I mean, even the Chinese who have built their trade advantages over the last four decades on cheap labor, even now they are rushing to actually automation and robotics faster than any other country on the planet. Um, uh, they build more rob robots and install more robots in their industrial uh, plants than any other country in the world because they can't complete, compete globally now with cheap labor of, in Vietnam and, and Thailand and places like that. So um, yeah, I, I think people are beginning to wake up to the challenges and sometimes I'm accused, I understand why, of chasing headlines in my novels. I really don't try to do that. I try to think about issues as I'm writing before they happen. And so like one of the things I did talk about in line of sight, oh, I'm sorry, in um, Firing Point, was this question of Chinese manufactured pharmaceuticals, which has been an issue for the last couple of years, actually. But, you know, I wrote the book and then the pandemic came out. And so the issue of where do we get our drugs from? And does it matter that our drugs are you know imported from China rather than manufactured here? And I think the answer overwhelmingly is yes, it does matter. And, and even, I think more importantly, uh, what's going on in, our, in, in the world now is we've seen the destruction of the middle class, that increasingly uh, middle class uh, jobs and opportunities are disappearing, not just because of globalism, but also because of auto mm -hmm. automation. And uh, as, as you hollow out the middle class, uh, peaceful, stable democracy becomes more and more difficult. And I think that's why you're gonna see this continuation of, of political strife around the world, and it will be centered on this issue of globalism versus nationalism. I think you're right. I'm trying to remember the book that I just read. I'm having a senior moment here, but the, the target, um, and this, this is a bigger theater for thriller writers than it is for people writing, let's say, a, a private eye or a detective story with a much more regional um, or local atmosphere to it. But anyway, the real target was corporations, that corporations, multinational corporations are a huge problem, that they actually have more money in many cases and more power than a nation state. Oh, absolutely, no question. No question. Um, uh, corporations that you know are, are worth a trillion dollars, right? you know, Apple, Amazon, they kind of keep bumping up against that until that recent stock decline. Um, there's no question that their reach and their power and then translate to political influence is absolutely overwhelming that the influence that these corporations have on on national politics around the world that don't represent you know us they represent themselves their own corporate interests it's, it's a real challenge and ironically it's an issue that you know people on the left and the right both agree on and uh you know but what's going to be done about it and how we move forward and how we address it you know we'll see how that plays out because there's lots of lip service to that but at the end of the day uh, the politicians who keep getting reelected are funded by these people and they somehow find a way not to actually ever regulate. Very true. And what I'm seeing in thrillers, because every good thriller has to have an antagonist as well as a protagonist so that you can have that terrific conflict, is that very often now, you know, it's not foreign nationals, but rather American corporations or American politicians or people that you would have thought were really on our team turn out to be the antagonists. Well, I mean, you know, I think Edward Snowden uh, probably 
showing a bit of a light on that. Um, it's amazing the amount of cooperation that some of the big tech uh, companies have given to organizations like you know the NSA. But on the flip side, um, we, we see the influence that they've had in uh, other countries and that you know, cooperating with other countries. I mean, for a while there, and I, I forget what the status is right now, but for a while there, for big tech companies to actually participate in China, they had to agree to the social controls um, right. that China wanted to exert, and they were willing to comply with that. And so, on the one hand, you know, lecturing us on the need for freedom of speech in our country, but on the other hand, you know, running in lockstep with a, a communist dictatorship to help them suppress their own people. So, another theme I've been exploring for the last few books, and sometimes I, I sound like I'm kind of losing my mind, but you know, this question of you know loyalty is really the theme of the uh, firing point. That's that's sort of the, the kernel that drives everything. And part of that subject for me is led to the question of you know an international corporation, a global corporation. You know, where do their loyalties lie, and where should they lie? I mean, should corporations, should an American corporation have some sense of American responsibility, uh, some sense of a loyalty to? You know the nation that gives them protection and as you know provides them for you know intellectual property rights and and so on and so forth. And it seems like too many corporations don't care about what happens to American citizens. All they care about is what's good for them. So when a company will pick up, you know, will lay off ten thousand Americans and run across the border somewhere and hire ten thousand foreign nationals because it's one tenth the price. Don't they care? They just put ten thousand people, you know, in the unemployment line. And, and there's a social cost of that, and they're not asked to pay for it. So I think this whole question of, you know, what are the true interests of a corporation, and, and do they lie in the community in which they are, you know, located? I think that's an issue that's going to be explored too in, in the years to come. I think you're absolutely right. And you know, as a person who has done an enormous amount of cruising, uh, and has seen both the good and the bad side of it, one of the real plagues of the cruise industry is that. Um, they don't have any responsibility to any of the nationalities aboard their ships, and they are registered in such a way that it's virtually impossible to have any sort of legal um, oversight or redress and so forth. And I think people really found out when some of these ships turned out to be um, places where people were trapped and couldn't get home and all, and there was no help forthcoming. I'm hoping that, if nothing else, the cruise industry will be regulated because it ended up that the governments had to go and do the work of the company, which is to bring people back to their own countries at government expense rather than at the cruise industry's expense because there really aren't any remedies. So I'll be very interested to see what happens. Well, it's dinner time about where you are, so I won't explore the subject in depth. But if you want to see, or at a time when you're not near a meal uh, and you feel fortified, uh, do a little research on the sewage dumping that just cruise ships are doing in the ocean. I know. Uh, you can't believe the amount of sewage and destruction that cruise ships are, are engaged in. Sing single ships are dumping unbelievable amounts of sewage in the ocean. Again, because it's unregulated, because they don't have to, because no one's looking over their shoulder. And, you know, again, it comes back to this question of, of both corporate responsibility and personal responsibility. Um, I don't want to see lots and lots of regulations. I don't believe in more and more government. Uh, but that means then people have to be more and more personally responsible. You know, I, I, we shouldn't have to tell a cruise line, don't exploit your workers, your foreign workers, you know, take care of your people. But if they're not going to do that, then you're right. Then you know we have to step up and do something. It's this is the tension, right? If 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 men were angels, no government were necessary. Uh, but men and women are not angels, and so we do need government. And the challenge is, how do we move forward? And uh, it's funny that you mentioned the flags of convenience uh, because that's an issue you know also raised in this novel, because this issue of who who owns these ships. And what are they doing, and what carbon are they transporting? It's a, it's also a real issue. It's a huge issue, and matter of fact, we could have a whole discussion just about mass tourism. For example, Barcelona that I mentioned to you earlier has been almost ruined by the cruise industry as a massive port. When when I was there last, you could not go to see any of the real highlights of Barcelona 
without tickets, time tickets. You couldn't go to La Sagrada, you couldn't go to Park Hill, you couldn't go to any of the Gaudi houses, you could barely move, as a matter of fact, and so the residents of the city really become hostage to this influx of people who fall off a ship and spend the day and may spend some money, but actually eat and drink and sleep on the ship, so it's not particularly benefiting the local restaurant and hotel community. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that at Stewart Island where they, and, and I'm hoping in New Zealand, I'm hoping that a lot of communities when Venice, for example, would be a great example, may be able to stand up for themselves better and refuse to have that sort of exploitation. I mean, I live in a tourist community, but it's a big enough community here that it gets diffused, unlike, say, Venice. Yeah, I'm also in a tourist community, and our community relies on tourism, And uh, but the difference is they're staying in the hotels, they, they eat in the restaurants, right. they, they buy the local stuff, so yeah, that's a completely different situation than cruising, and, and cruising is awesome, and uh, I think it's a great way to in, enjoy the world, but it does come at a cost. The, the trip to Barcelona to visit it is go there during you know the mass protests like we did. Not many tourists around, so we actually had a pretty easy time of getting into places. Very smart, or go off season. Let me turn over here for a moment. Patrick, do you have any comments or questions that Not so far. have come in? All right, um, so Mike, um, if you were gonna make like a two second pitch for this, two minute pitch for this book, what would you say? In two seconds, I'd say buy it. <laughs> uh, the, the larger the would be, one. yeah. <laughs> but the larger pitch would be something like, uh, well, Jack Ryan Jr. is on vacation in Spain. He winds up chasing down the terrorist killers who murdered his friend. At the same time, his dad, President Ryan, is uh, battling uh, in unseen high-tech forces that are sinking ships in the remote South Pacific. And somehow, miraculously, those two stories come together. Miraculously, boy, how about that? I would say almost as if on purpose. I think one of the real pleasures of reading your books have always your your own books or the Clancy books is the is the travel having a sort of just cruise travel, um, but at least um, I, it's a wonderful chance to go and you know spend some time in places that at least at the moment we aren't reasonably going to get to, or in some sure. cases we might never get to, um, and so that's a real pleasure of reading international thrillers. It's a it's a wonderful genre. It's even more of a pleasure to, to write them. Uh, my wife but, and myself in particular have a deep and abiding commitment to research. And I promise you, every, every bubbly drink that's been drunk in that book and everything that's been eaten has been thoroughly researched, I, I promise you. And uh, adult beverages and uh, places to visit. I, I, I love travel. We love travel. My wife and I are both very curious people. And so it's a joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to, to do that for readers. Uh, but it's also important to me as a storyteller. You know, I don't want to talk about Barcelona if I'm not staying in Barcelona. So it's a, it's a quirk of mine. Not at all. I think it's a real asset. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do next, kiddo. Um, and keep me posted. I want to thank you for spending time with us. Do you have a few questions? Oh, now? wait, stop. Yeah. Patrick now has a we few a questions. Few. <laughs> Pause. He's going to come over here and read them to you so you can answer them. All right. Uh, hey, Mike. Um, this Patrick, question, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? Great, thank you. Uh, it says, in this crazy world that we, that we never know what will happen, uh, as an author, is it satisfying to be able to control the ending? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, in real life, there's seldom closure or satisfying endings, and I really pride myself because it's so important to me to have a satisfying ending, not one that just wraps up the plot, but that has an emotional satisfaction. So I, I love that question. Uh, I'm also of the prejudice that I think the ending is the most important part of the book. I, you can read a brilliant book that is just absolutely thrilling until the last three pages, and if you don't stick the ending, it, it just ruins the rest of the experience. So endings are really important in books, not so much in life. Um, let's see. Here's an interesting question. Has Mr. Madden ever considered writing novels in Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? Uh, yo hablo cerveza. <laughs> That's about it. You, uh, you speak, no, you speak uh, beer. I, I have a little Spanish, a little bit of several languages, uh, not mastered any of them. 
<laughs> I do love language. I haven't spent enough time in cultures to really um, uh, to really imbue them. You know, I have sort of like the classroom experience, especially. You know, you study, you memorize a list, you get the A, and then you walk out there and you really can't communicate, which is not good. Um, but I would love to actually write another language. I think it'd be really exciting because I'm so intentional now with English, but I'm familiar with it. To to come at another language uh, and really engage with it to, in in a literary form. I mean, what a challenge that would be. I got to think about that. One. I, I may have to do that. I'm That's gonna awesome. That's a great I'm, question. I'm gonna recommend an app to you, which I am extremely fond of. I I discovered um, it by accident. It's called Duolingo. D U O L I N G O, and I have been learning Latin because I never I can speak other languages, but I somehow bypassed Latin, and I thought truly a literate person should be able to do some Latin, and it does make you conversational. It isn't necessarily you know an academic grounding in learning a language, but it does help you get up to speed in terms of being able to converse in it and speak it. I could recommend Duolingo to anybody watching this. You can pick your language, and it's really great. Five minutes a day, and you'd be surprised. Yeah, it is amazing, and it's fascinating. I understand why we do the academic approach to language acquisition, but in fact, none of us learn language that way as a rule, right? You grow up hearing it and practicing it, and that's why growing up in a bilingual household is such an advantage, and you, you acquire the grammar, even though you don't technically understand the grammar. Um, I speak English second language, and I absolutely love doing that. And to, to walk with a person who doesn't speak the language, they don't know what they don't know, and you don't know what they don't know. And the whole process of exploring is just so awesome. So to flip that is something like Duolingo, like you said, you're learning to converse. You're, you're, you're finding context uh, for these words, and that's what makes it stick. So that's, that's awesome. It is. Uh, let's see. Maurice asks, what's next uh, after Clancy for you? Uh, working on a what is considered a top secret project. Uh, it's my first collaborative effort. Uh, it is uh, outlined and rolling, and uh, announcement soon. But want to get this baby up and, and, and walking uh, before we announce the name. So, but uh, thank you, Maurice, and I uh, appreciate the question. Stay tuned. That's just about it. That about it. I think that's a wonderful way to end. You know, there's now all the suspense of, oh, what next? God, I think you're a wonderful writer, Tom, and a really interesting person and a good person besides. So I certainly want you to keep moving and let us know what we can do to make it better, make it happen. You keep selling books. That's all That's all I want. And I, 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 will, I will be there. But thank you so much. From day one, you've been so supportive. I Really, uh, I can't thank you enough. An important part of my journey, and uh, will continue to be so as, as, as the story unfolds, as we keep looking for that perfect ending. <laughs> it's really been a privilege, and it's also been a privilege and a pleasure to host all of you this evening. Thank you so much for watching, and I'm going to say goodbye, Mike.